This presentation will discuss some of the normal anatomical variants seen in shoulder arthroscopy. A knowledge of these variants is essential in order to recognise those appearances which represent true pathology. When performing the diagnostic routine, we often start by visualising the long head of biceps tendon. There are a number of variants seen in terms of the tendon itself, the exit from the joint, its proximal attachment and its vascular markings and synovial coverings. The tendon itself is sometimes bifid, as shown here, and there may be accessory heads, not to be confused with a longitudinal split on MRI, and in rare cases the biceps may be congenitally absent. The tendon exits the joint between the anterior and posterior pulleys. These pulleys are formed from the superior glenohumeral ligament and coracohumeral ligaments and have variable contributions from the supraspinatus and subscapularis tendons, and this is shown diagrammatically here. In terms of the proximal attachment, the biceps usually arises from the superior glenoid tubercle and the posterior superior labrum. However, the biceps tendon occasionally arises from the rotator cuff and capsule, and rarely from the rotator cable alone. Often there are vascular markings on the superior surface of the tendon. These are normal and should not be confused with tendon inflammation. Sometimes the tendon will have vinculi or a mesentery attached. Sometimes the tendon will be completely covered with synovium due to failure of invagination of the tendon during development. The superior labrum may vary in terms of attachment of the long head of biceps, in terms of the attachment of the labrum to the glenoid, and in terms of the edge of the labrum itself. The long head of biceps attaches predominantly to the posterior labrum, as in types 1 and 2 often to both the anterior and posterior labrum, and more rarely to the anterior labrum alone. The labrum is usually firmly attached to the superior glenoid, but may become more loose with age. There may be a sublabral recess between 11 and 1 o'clock, and the superior labrum may be completely detached, forming a sublabral foramen at 3 to 1 o'clock. There may be a meniscoid attachment of the superior labrum, often with a significant cleft under the labral edge. The anterosuperior labrum is usually firmly attached, but as previously mentioned, there may be a sublabral foramen or the labrum may be absent altogether. A sublabral foramen occurs in about 10% of shoulders and is often associated with a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament, which attaches to the free part of the labrum. When the labrum is absent altogether, a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament may attach to the base of the biceps tendon, as in the Buford complex. The labrum is generally firmly attached in 95% of cases and meniscoid in 5% of patients. Rarely, there's a cleft seen between the glenoid and attachment of the posterior labrum, as seen in this view of the posterior inferior labrum, but it's common to see a deep capsular fold adjacent to the posterior labrum. The glenohumeral ligaments are essentially thickenings of the capsule and pass from the anatomical neck of the humerus to various parts of the labrum. The superior glenohumeral ligament is the most consistent and is present in the vast majority of people. It originates at the superior glenoid tubercle but also at the base of the coracoid and runs parallel to the biceps and inserts onto the lesser tuberosity. The coracohumeral ligament originates from the lateral border of the coracoid and inserts on the lesser and greater tuberosities spanning the groove. The middle glenohumeral ligament is the most variable of all. When viewed arthroscopically, it crosses behind the subscapularis tendon at an angle of 45 degrees. In about 70% of shoulders, the middle glenohumeral ligament is a thick folded band. In 20% it will be cord-like and in 10% it will be a very thin veil or even absent. The inferior glenohumeral ligament has three components, the anterior and posterior glenohumeral ligaments which are a variable substance and the intervening axillary pouch. The pouch may be smooth or fenestrated but should not be separated from the humeral neck at any point. There are some variants of the glenoid itself including the mid glenoid notch which is situated at the junction of the upper two and lower three fifths of the socket. It can be quite deep and should not be confused with a bony bank art. A tuft of synovium may be seen above this and should not be confused with label damage. It's normal 
particularly in adults, to have an area of thinning in the cartilage in the centre of the glenoid face known as the bare spot. This is often used as a reference for estimating traumatic glenoid bone loss. There's also a bare area on the humerus, which is devoid of cartilage, of variable width, adjacent to the infraspinatus insertion. This may contain deep vascular channels and should not be confused with a hill sax lesion, which will have normal cartilage medial to it. The rotator cuff also demonstrates normal variation. The subscapularis tendon may be bifid in 3% of cases. The supraspinatus insertion is usually smooth, with up to a millimetre gap between it and the edge of the articular cartilage. The rotator cable is a capsular thickening and is an extension of the coracohumeral ligament. The crescent is the thinner cuff tissue contained within the boundaries of the cable and is the part of the cuff with a poorer blood supply. Finally, the infraspinatus will often have fenestrations or ridges. Many thanks for listening. For further information and educational content, please visit shoulderspecialist.co.uk or subscribe to the YouTube channel.